Thank you again. I'm sorry you guys have to keep hearing from me this whole conference. Um, so yeah, my talk is definitely going to be a bit different from what we just heard, but I think that's exciting that we're switching things up a little bit. Um, today I called, I named my presentation Navigating Seamless Access to a Fertility Preservation Program Near You, and I'm actually super excited to hear that a lot of conversation thus far has been, you know, do we actually send patients to places if we don't have fertility preservation? And I kind of want to start off by thinking about, I grew up, I'm one of five children, and I grew up with these four little Italian great aunts, and they always said this quote to us, that you've got two hands, you've got one to help yourself and one to help others. And I think that that simple sentence is what we can just live and breathe by when it comes to oncofertility and building programs. Because even though I'm now coming from a more mature program, we continue to have to keep building and understanding the new nuances every day as oncology grows and other populations grow. But as we are able to help other programs, I think when you do reach out to other teams, that story is what you take back to your hospital so that you can build your own program. And so we have to start somewhere. And so I hope by the time we finish speaking today, we can really learn about accessing programs near you, how can we ensure that the coordination is seamless so that we're not scared and nervous to do it? I think we make things a little bit more scary than it needs to be when we are referring patients out. Um, I want to have some clinical questions to ask when you are thinking about sending patients or when you're thinking about accepting patients. Um, and we'll go through a quick case study as well on one patient that did reach out um, to our institution to see if we could help. And so, as you know, I'm going to go more quickly through the beginning of these slides because Dr. Burns and Dr. Rios addressed this yesterday. But, you know, if you have a fertility program, the biggest thing we want to say is what's your goal? And so, as we talked about yesterday, we have a very um, strict goal that we adhere by, but we also want to keep this goal when we're talking about referring other patients from other institutions and accepted exclusion criteria. Because if somebody does call me and they do hit our accepted exclusion criteria, I might have to say on the phone, you know, we don't think this is necessarily appropriate. So we're constantly speaking the same language. So low-hanging fruit, you know, we talked about yesterday about finding and identifying these REIs near you. Um, so this is actually like Cincinnati. I don't even know which one to point to. We'll point to all of them. Um, so down here where this little car is, that is where the hospital is located. Um, but there was a day when I got into my car and I was excited because it was my new mom mobile after having a child. So I got in that new car and I was like, I'm going to drive around to all the REIs in Cincinnati and I have to figure out what resources do we have. I want to go like negotiate some low sperm banking prices. And I think having a physical presence and showing them, email is one thing, but to show up to these places and have assigned times to sit down and speak with them. So where we have um, the hospital over here, there's another REI located to the west of us, one more on um, kind of towards the east and then up here north. Um, and then there's this other one all the way up here, which is actually where our andrology lab was with the University of Cincinnati for our ovarian tissue crowd preservation. So that's where we would actually ship the ovaries once they came out and we'd get all the way up here. But the purpose was really to find out sperm banking, who can get me in the quickest, who's willing to help me with this population, and to tell your story. This is where you are going to tell your qualitative story and have them listen about what's going on in your institution and how you need help. So again, I encourage everybody to just really look right in front of you and figure out what you do have. Just a bit of the history. We've been on both sides of things. So we did not always have all these protocols. And so back in 2009, when we were just offering sperm and oocyte, ovarian um, transposition, and then we were talking more about Lupron being possible fertility preservation. We learned a lot since then. Um, but we had to keep expanding. And so when we had our protocol, that's when we were working with the University of Cincinnati lab. But we... I'd also realized that as soon as I was talking to these young patients, parents of little boys were coming up to me and saying, you know, you're not offering me anything. I talked to this mom and what are we doing? And so I remember literally sitting down with my fellow. We Googled Dr. Orwig and we called him that day. And I said, hey, can I send you patients? Sure, why not? My team said, Olivia, what are you doing? I'm like, we have to be able to offer this and keep this equal, but we're not just gonna be sending people without methodically talking through this. And so we learned both ways that not only was I sending over a dozen patients up to Pittsburgh who half didn't speak English, did, I mean, I was asking Kyle things like, tell me what the, like, like there's got to be an animal print. Like, you know, we have a armadillo building. Like, I need every symbol to help my patients get to exactly where you need to be so that I can trust my, my institution will trust that it's okay to send patients out and they're going to come back safe and sound. And so as we matured the program, um, the more I sent patients up to Pittsburgh, the more Cincinnati Children's realized we got to get on board with this, with urology. 
And so that helped, again, the opposite direction, build the program back in our favor. And so with that being said, we were able to get the TTC protocol offered. Right now, I did get a lot of questions over the past couple of days if we're doing TESI at Children's. We are not currently doing that with our pediatric urology team. We do have a local reproductive urologist who's willing to help. But I do think that's room for us to grow and to have that be a part of us. Because as you guys know, the REIs are super busy and it is hard to get in as urgently as you want. And so access is huge. We learned about Fertility Scout the other um, yesterday, which I thought was really cool, but this is right from the consortium. And so I think it's really important for you to know your region, but then also know the states around you and get to understand what people are offering. And so this is so easy to access the website there at the bottom, but to truly understand, you know, it makes it so easy on the website. And if this isn't right, contact Lauren and tell them that we do offer this now. So everybody here, check in the room that if you are offering something, that this is correct on all the websites. And so as you know, our team, we've definitely evolved over time, but the more that we grew, the more I was getting calls to take patients from other institutions. And so I had to learn now, not only do we keep functioning internally with this team, but how can I now take this model and help other institutions to bring patients in? And so, you know, as the kind of integral centerpiece and being the main intake, I still have the coordination with our whole team. So oncology, gynecology, REI, urology, um, the blue box up at the top, those are all my key players. And I want to just keep advocating that if you can find a key player to be a part of your team from each of these disciplines, this is how we've really been able to move mountains. And our research coordinators, ethics, social work, and then the primary teams within our Cancer and Blood Disease Institute, we do have a pretty conglomerate institute. And so I, we really had to learn to navigate each individual team. So whether it was the liquids team, the solid tumor team, the neuroonc, bone marrow transplant. And then they each come in their own unique way. And I know a lot of navigators in the room where people are trying to start these programs, where do I start? And there is not an equal, there's not an easy answer for all these teams. As you guys know, everybody works differently. So whether someone comes into the ED with leukemia, how are we gonna catch them versus the Ewing sarcoma tumor that's being worked up for seven days outpatient? Or the bone marrow transplant that's getting this elective, life-saving, elective transplant for the next you know, six months they've been working up. So you learn how to adapt and use your processes within each of these teams. And having, um, you know, we went over this yesterday, but just having that central point and then learning how to navigate each team from the role, then you are able to bring it all the way to that follow-up process. So in order to help bring on um, more patients to expand the access to fertility preservation, it was definitely a call to help within my own team and a call for more responsibilities. And so I definitely went to my own fertility preservation team to say, hey, you know, we need to help around the region. I need to be able to help these people who are just calling me off, you know, ringing my phone. Can I come in the next two weeks? I'm from whichever state. So I wasn't able to do this until I got support from my own team. And then I also realized there's additional support, but this wasn't as hard as it seemed. So for people who do have programs, I think just taking that next little step to figure out, do you have someone in anesthesia you can call to make sure that they're okay seeing these patients that have never been to your hospital before? Do you have general surgery if they wanna couple this procedure with something else, whether it's for a cholecystectomy or it's for a line? And then scheduling, making sure you know the right schedulers to say, again, we've never seen this patient, but I wanna get them on for these um, respected surgeries. And so what I was able to do was identify, again, a support person so that when someone came in, regardless of the diagnosis, I knew I had someone to keep an eye on them. So if it was a sickle cell patient, I had my identified hematologist and transplant doctor. I said, this is who's coming in. These are the records. And to understand who this patient is. Because if we do have a sickle cell crisis, but they're coming for OTC, I need to make sure I know who my hematology friend is to make sure they know that they're getting admitted through their service. And the big thing, too, was to make sure I had good billing support so we could do prior authorizations, insurance support, my CRCs. And then we've had a fantastic program coordinator who's been giving us about 20 hours a week, and she's been able to help facilitate lodging and making sure we can get reduced prices. Um, I had a mom, like, ask me for 45 minutes about this movie theater in Cincinnati that I had no idea what she was talking about, but she was certain she was going to go to this movie before her OTC the next morning. And, you know, those are the little things that made this a little bit more enjoyable for them to bring their sick child here. And they went to that movie theater and Sarah helped me get some discount tickets to make everything go a little bit better. 
And then anesthesia. It's been fantastic to have an anesthesiologist who understands when I've got someone coming in hot from an outside hospital that we need to do a quick phone consult and see if we can see them once they get here, as well as general surgery. I have a lead NP that I can go to to help me facilitate line orders and making sure we're ordering the right thing. And so to increase outside referrals, I think, you know, I think by the, by the, when we increase outside referral, again, we're in turn helping your institution to build that story, to bring it back, to say, this is what we're doing, this is where we're going. And I think between the media, institution, friends, peers, and marketing, people are hearing about oncofertility. So whether or not you're even maybe doing consults, it's in the chat groups on Facebook. They're hearing about it from other people. Everybody has a friend now. We, I'm so glad it's gotten to this point. It wasn't like this five years ago. And now people come to me saying, I was waiting for you to come see me. Where were you? The I'm like, I've just learned about you. I'm here. But people know now. And so having easy ways for patients and families to get a hold of you, our electronic interventions, I think, really took our program to the next level. And people laugh at me when I was excited to get a desk phone, but I legit was pumped because now I had a landline where I could do consults before they even got here and really screen out the process. But the fertility consult email has been fantastic. And then we also built inpatient and outpatient order sets. So that way we know when you have all these orders coming in, you can really work based off of acuity. So if I have an inpatient one, I pretty much 99% sure I'll be seeing them before my outpatient order, where I know I probably have some more time to work up that case. And so making sure your website's up to date and you've got great contacts and references and referrals. So the consult itself, I wanted to go over when patients do call me just quickly how I can do the consult without knowing too much about them, because sometimes it's the patient calling me and not the medical professionals, where then if they call, I can get more notes and understanding. Patients tend to typically always know their ANC account because that's one of the first things I ask them. Um, but you definitely want to make sure you have a good contact with their team before you move any um, forward into the consult. But I typically, people always ask me, you know, how are you doing these consults, especially when people are calling you off the fly and you're on the phone? And I think you can still have a decent conversation not quite knowing just how in-depth their treatment's going to be. You can surface level get things moving. And so always introducing yourself, telling, you, telling them that, you know, we're going to look at every single patient that comes through here, whether you're male, you're female, it doesn't matter your sex, it doesn't matter your age, everybody at our hospital is going to get a fertility consult. And introducing the team, I think it's really important when you are going, especially as you're building your programs, patients and families want to hear how robust and collaborative your team is. When I say I've spoken to your oncologist, that sigh of relief, especially when I first started doing this, you could just see it in the patient's and family's eyes. And I think it's just so important. Name drop. Use the name of their oncologist. You may have never heard of that person in your, in your life. It doesn't matter. Just say their name because you got the order from somebody and they're all going to be on board. And with that being said, just letting them know that we're all looking at them from different angles, which makes the team even more robust and reputable. And so as the consults continue, now I wouldn't get this far if someone were calling me for a referral, but as we go into the rooms, we always make sure we're saying we're looking at your chemotherapy, we're looking at your radiation, we're wanting to look at a risk assessment. Um, and we also want to do more than that. We're not just, as we said, this whole conference. Electing fertility preservation is excellent, but that's not the reason we're here. We are doing this as education to understand their future and reproductive health. And so we never want to discredit giving any type of word or praise to just even the hormonal effects and how we need to focus on that in the future. So I go over with every consult just the two basic roles and I say the ovary and I keep it as simple as possible. You know, the ovary has two jobs, the testicle has two jobs and I go through the hormone and I go through fertility. And so we talk about with the males that, you know, you're going to have testosterone when puberty hits. With the females, what is the role of estrogen and progesterone? And so you can just briefly talk about that, but for our consults who we do feel maybe they're too sick to do fertility preservation. That's okay. We still want to have this conversation about the reproductive health. And so when you do get a call or you want to refer somebody out, we're always looking for communication, communication throughout the whole workup period. But I'm always asking people who is their main gatekeeper. And we can just learn from each other in this room that the gatekeeper sounds different at everybody's hospital. We use the term care manager, and I'm sure maybe 10% of the people in this room use that patient navigator, care manager. I'm always fascinated till I figure out what the person I'm looking for on the other end of the phone is trying to tell me who is gatekeeping all that care. And there typically always is somebody. That is your key person to keep the process going if they want to come to your hospital. Or if you're referring them out, someone needs to own that patient in case. 
And so prep. If we are ready to take on a patient, there are certain things that I absolutely want to have before we'll allow anybody to come for fertility preservation. And making sure, I know some of this is so basic, um, but I get a lot of patients too that want to undergo bone marrow transplant for fertil before, um, have fertility preservation completed before bone marrow transplant. And we make it very known that they have to have a donor, they have to have dates, and I want that set in stone before they will come to us. Um, and I think it's super important because no one wants to take an ovary out and then find out the transplant fell through or anything like that. So um, we are very strict in terms of understanding the exact workup our patients are going through. We also want to obviously know their labs, their last H&P, if they've had any anesthesia consults, um, or if you know some patients have maybe had a previous fertility consult, but they still come to us. I want to see what that other person had stated and make sure we're aligning with the same risk and understanding the treatment plan so we can all calculate our own fertility risk assessment. Care Everywhere has been really um, instrumental and awesome. It's a feature in Epic, our EMR, where we can look at other institutions' charts. And now even in Epic, I call it the Google bar, which is not appropriate, but there's a search bar. And you type the word fertility, and it pulls any note from regional hospitals that have talked about just fertility. So I use that all the time to just search keywords and do a massive chart review. So we did have um, a young woman who called, and she was coming um, from the South. Um, and this was a patient that was uh, 28 years old, and she called in a panic, and she just started saying, I've got leukemia, I couldn't freeze my eggs, I need your help, I found you online, I'm starting a transplant in three weeks, can you help me, can you help me? And as we slowed down the conversation, we were able to talk through everything, I had to, you know, when you hear leukemia, you definitely are thinking about that absolute neutrophil count, and we're thinking about, you know, how stable are you? And as a young woman, she definitely felt like, this is my decision, I'm coming no matter what. But I had to make it very clear that we were going to have to get clearance and understanding from your home oncologist that you were safe and your transplant doctor. And I think she was a little thrown off that I wanted so much information. And lo and behold, it all worked out. We learned so much about her. And um, so we had to kind of watch her and C counts because they weren't rising on their own. But about four to six weeks later, we were able, she came up, we took her over and she went home. But I just want to show that as much as it may seem like a lot of work, I think when we get these flow plans and these easy, this is what we need, we can move a lot quicker than we all think we can when it comes to these patients. And so count recommendations, um, every institution is going to be the same. I don't think we have a great science behind this. I think this is another great research project to really understand what is the safest ANC count before we're going to do these types of surgeries. Um, we have to take in a lot to consideration. What's your ANC going in and is your ANC going to stay up when we're talking about exiting and going into post-op? So we have said for patients who want to come to us for OTC or TTC, we want ANC counts above 750 and rising. Um, we don't want a patient who we know is going to be that high one day and then drop to zero the next. So really looking at the trend of the absolute neutrophil count. Our bone marrow transplant team, I think one reason why we've had such a buy-in is we um, just worked with them so hard to articulate how we can most safely do this for their patients. And as a bone marrow transplant division, they came up with the rule that all patients will re recover five to seven days after OTC and the same with TTC. And so we really just stick and adhere to that with our outside patients. So if someone does want to come, we do recommend that five to seven day healing time. Again, Historically, there have been patients who go right into transplant, but we typically, if it's a, let's say like a high-risk Ewing sarcoma, we'll take out the ovary, start chemo that night, but the thought of them getting high-dose chemo in such a short amount of time is the reasoning and thought our transplant team felt comfortable with with waiting a couple days. So we'll typically, we'll typically still do the line, admit them. Sometimes they'll go home for a couple days and post up, or they'll just stay local or stay admitted. So one of the big things, too, was we all have been talking about reducing costs to our patients and families. And so one way to do that with OTC and TTC was coupling it with a line. And so being able to say, you know, can you get a line here? I needed to know more information. And so um, I was really happy to make some good connections with pediatric surgery to really understand what are they looking for and assessing before you would place a central line. And so I needed to know that if I'm selling, let's couple this together. We can try and make the cost reduced and all that. So they gave me a great list of questions to understand before our patients get here. Um, and these are the same questions that they get when they place the line order. So I told them I would try and expedite that as fast as possible if I could understand what they needed. 
And so for line placements, they gave me their recommendations as well in terms of counts, um, but really understanding, you know, what was their history? Do you have a line? Any issues with clotting and all of that? So those are just some of the, sorry, it's kind of busy, but those are the questions we'll go through. And then we took it a next step. We all love great charts, some schematic, whatever you want to call it. And we sat down with our pediatric surgeons and said, how can we really map this out? Because if we're throwing a line into our patients, well, we're going to need some education. They're not just going to go home with the new CVC. And how is this going to look? So if you look, we've got on the left-hand side, the pre-procedure, periop, and post-procedure. And it really just starts up there on the top left-hand corner. If you know, the initial consults obtained, do they want a line? And we just kind of track right on through this graph to understand, you know, when should they arrive? Do they need transfusions? Are they going to get the CVC placement or not? Do they go to the PACU? Do they have to go and get admitted? And so everybody coming to the table and sitting down to make this was huge because I knew then we had that support and I knew if, you know, and these don't happen all the time. So when it does, we can all pull this back up and kind of just run right through it. So the prep continues, you know, as we are working up patients or as you guys work up other patients or you're sending patients, we keep emailing all the time to make sure we're keeping in contact with the health status of the patients. And so we always, as a fertility team, will review all the records I obtain to make sure we do have a safe transfer. And so in order to do that, I make sure I sit down with the table. We have surgery meetings. We have our monthly CFCP meeting. I also like could reach my hand out and touch Julie with how close her office is. So that's pretty awesome. So I can be like, hey, what do you think about this? And we just talk through all these cases. Then we have to talk about the admission and the plan. And so typically sickle cell patients, we admit the night before for hydration. We get the hematology team on board. But most other patients will come in that morning. We admit them to the same day surgery. If they are just getting the OTC, they will stay locally that night in a hotel, and then we'll let them go the next morning. So they're with us for maybe 36, 48 hours. So risk assessment, I always want to make sure, of course, when the patients are coming, we have a good risk assessment of understanding what the patient's already been exposed to. We have some more liberal protocols in most institutions in terms of our OTC. Um, but with Dr. Burns and Dr. Um, Christine Phillips, they are my always lead oncologists to go to when they come up with the risk assessment. So for this patient who called, 29-year-old AML, we talked about her bone marrow transplant. She's getting cytoxin and TBI, making her at high risk. Um, I get a lot of questions from you guys about seeing other risk assessments. So I just populated a couple more for you guys to look at what our institution does when we're typing these out. So every note gets a risk assessment. And if I do a note or Julie does a note or Andrew or urology, we're copying and pasting the risk assessment from the oncologist. And so they literally will calculate out, and you can see down to the gram on the said rate, and then we'll put at the bottom what the risk is. So this was a prepubertal male with high-risk neuroblastoma, um, five cycles of chemo, MIBG. And I think a lot of times, too, we have to remember that when patients are coming to us or coming even for second opinions, we need to be calculating what they saw and what they're going to get. So you always have your pre-risk assessment and then your full out premature ovarian insufficiency risk assessment or testicular um, failure risk assessment. Um, and then this one was a rhabdomyosarcoma patient, came in with soft palate, um, got, received the ARST 0531. And when we calculated the cyclophosphamide on that, it was projected to be at seven. Um, and so another high risk patient for azospermia. So these are just some examples for you guys to see. So it, historically, we have had some ups and downs with patients who are coming from other places, and this could happen to you guys if you're referring people out or accepting, um, and that's really keeping track of their fever, neutropenia. Um, we had a patient who was about to come to us and picked up a GI bug, so we had to postpone things a little, but all I can say about that is just the continued communication. Every to every other day, I'm constantly checking in on these patients and families because I get it too. When we have to take something off the OR, People don't really always like that, right? You kind of are like, ugh, again, we're not going to end up. But I think if we can catch things as soon as possible, the better it off to take things off the OR and not have people be too upset about it. So, um, and just how it would look if when our patients arrive here. So when I do a fertility consult over the phone, I'm definitely prepping the patients to understand what they're going to be going through. Um, we do, I send a lot of information electronically, but when they arrive, they come straight to our fertility clinic where they're going to have a formal sit down meeting with Dr. Rios and myself to meet us in person. Um, I laugh because I think 
Bryson and I have been like meeting people at the elevator. They, I, it's not like we're due always this nice treatment, but for some reason, everybody just kind of walks out as I'm going to clinics. So we're like, welcome, let's go to clinic and sit down and have a nice formal consult. And that's when we'll do them the consent. So we have about a two hour appointment as soon as they hit the ground and they get to Cincinnati Children's. We figure out all the consenting, surgical research. We help them with the ReproTech paperwork. Um, and then we figure out, are they getting admitted or not? If they're not getting admitted, they're gonna go to a local hotel where we can get discounted prices. And if they are getting admitted, straight to admitting and go up to the floor for their night before surgery. Um, in the procedure day, you, like I said, it could be same day or it can inpatient or outpatient. They'll go to the OR. Typically, most of them go to the PACU and we ask everybody to stay local in a hotel that evening, unless you live maybe within like a two hour radius or so. Um, and then I, that day, will send the team back all the records, the surgery report. We give families a packet of stuff to bring back. But that continued communication with the outside team can only help build and cultivate those continued relationships. And then, you know, for the follow-up, we do check in with our patients. Um, we always do post-op calls, make sure everybody's doing okay, make sure we're taking off bandages, we're looking at the incision sites, sending all the notes to the home team, Reprotect paperwork. And then we ship our ovaries about every two to three weeks. We have a, um, a good amount of ovaries where we're able to do that with Reprotect. And um, it's been fantastic working with them, having that great relationship where we can get the ovaries. They're on site for a short amount of time and then we get them off. And then billing. I always actually follow with my patients because I want to see what the bill actually looked like because I would say no matter what, how hard we try, this process is still never perfectly seamless and so I always make sure when they get their bill they call me because I want to know exactly what that price is to make sure that they did get the out-of-pocket discounted rate and that they weren't getting every little thing added on. So the biggest takeaway I think we all just need to keep helping each other again help each other out if you have a mature program accept patients and if you don't send them and then keep building your story to take back to your institution. I think that's the only way we're gonna keep growing. It worked with our TTC and we finally got that protocol up and going and now it is great to have that on board at our hospital. Um, and preparing and understanding what outside fertility institutions want from you. So when you contact that local one that can help you, get the quick checklist so you know this is what we need or we know that I'm actually gonna tell this family that Cincinnati or Nationwide or whoever, they have this, but your ANC has been 20 for three weeks and we just don't feel safe about it. Just hearing that enough they know you've thought about it. They know you've thought about sending them out, but you know what's number one is saving their life and getting their treatment and staying where it's safe. So if you have any questions, those are my two kids. <laughs>